I played some fun games last year, and while not all of them came out in 2017, there's still some fantastic games worth talking about. These are my top 10 games I played in 2017. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about a cave, a story about a robot rolling with a whole lot of bravery. Cave Story is a little 2D platformer that originally came out in 2004 and has since been remade and ported to a few places. And while I played the original, I consider this release different enough that it still counts. Cave Story on Switch is freaking great, my dudes. Not only can you play with the updated or original graphics, you can change the music to any of the arrangements and there are more than just the remastered and original scores. The amount of customization in this game is completely unnecessary, but it's very much appreciated. The game feels exactly like it did in its original incarnations, and yes, it has the changed dialogue for whatever stupid reason. Without a co-op in hard mode where you literally just play as me, I mean, just look at them. And aside from the dumb minuscule changes that bother me and only me and I've chosen to ignore wholeheartedly, I've had a lot of fun with Cave Story, and while I'm still not great at this game at all, I now have the chance to legitimately finish it. Also the dogs. You can carry dogs on your head. Best game. Look, look, I know it's only number 10, but best game. Now every time I visit my boyfriend Justin, we like to play a game together to completion if we can. Now I got Justin Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze when it came out and boy was that a mistake because he gets so busy he can't play anything I send him. Luckily when I went over there I finally sat him down and we finished this game. The music and visuals were stunning and the levels were creative. I'm constantly blown away by what the game is able to do. The silhouette levels are always the best. I mean look at these colors. Ah, uh, it's an artist's paradise. I'm not good at 2D platformers by any means, but luckily playing together with him helped me get at least a teeny bit better. Also playing as Dixie helps. It helps a lot. A lot of my favorite levels were the Rocky Barrel ones in particular. The simple controls and the rocking music kept the more difficult levels from getting too frustrating. Shoutouts to that Fruit Factory level with the penguin. Word of warning though, only go into this game with someone you trust because oh boy, it could get nasty. Nintendo releasing three different mobile games in 2017, it's no wonder I'm still on my phone 24-7. But before that, I was playing Solitarica. It's a weird concept for a game, but surprisingly addicting and fun. It's a turn-based roguelike solitaire game, with a dash of D&D for good measure. How it works is that you get every card off the board by picking either the number value directly above or below the card you have flipped up. As soon as you turn to grab another card to hopefully get a few more cards, the enemies you face get to have a turn. They can do numerous things like give card status ailments to adding more cards to damaging you. That's where your abilities come in. Special powers to remove status effects or cards to make combos easier. Different classes you can choose from specialize in two of the four powers, and some are definitely more challenging than others. What I enjoyed so much about this game was how easy it is to jump in and play. I stayed up longer than I should have to try and get further in a run than I had before on more than one occasion. Sometimes RNG can be a little BS with what attributes enemies have sometimes, but it makes it the sweeter when you beat them. I don't necessarily like pouring money into something on my phone for dumb reasons, but the 4 bucks I paid for the full version I found totally worth it. Hot dang, it's a good time for mobile gaming. <laughs> What am I going to do about this segment? Odyssey is a lot of people's favorite game of 2017, and it's only number 7. I'm definitely enjoying my time with Super Mario Odyssey. It's bright and colorful, it has a desert world I actually liked for once. The first world is spoopy and it's fun, so why is it this low? I need to play more of it, and platformers aren't usually my thing, plain and simple. Platformers are the bane of my gaming experience skill-wise, and I'm glad that Odyssey is mostly friendly to complete morons like myself. Plus, Bowser is super dapper here. Oh, I will say that the first Bowser fight is one of my favorite bosses I've faced, period. It was the first time in the Mario platformers that a boss put a smile on my face as much as this did. The music is also catchy as heck and collecting moons is admittedly very addicting. Cappy is fun to throw around and is probably the best mechanic the platformers have seen in a while. The game is great, but I like the other ones a bit more. Next up is a little indie game by the name of Overcooked. It's a simple game where you and up to three others cooking kitchens all in preparation to stop the flying spaghetti monster in the impending apocalypse. And no, that's not a spoiler at all. The game opens up with you trying to fight it off by feeding it but failing miserably. So the only solution is to travel back in time to prepare for the apocalypse. 
It was a lot more difficult than I originally anticipated, but if you get someone you trust to play along with you, you'll be in for a great time. It's a short but sweet game, and I feel like it's the perfect length. Not long enough to be tired of the mechanics, but just long enough to be satisfied with the content. If it wasn't enough, there is DLC and the Switch version automatically comes with it. I would say more, but I plan on reviewing this game and I'll give my full opinion there. But you should definitely go buy it. Well, Cuphead and his pal Mugman, they like to roll the dice. And apparently die a lot, because this game is difficult. But that's not even why I was so interested in this game to begin with. It's the Rubber Hose 1930 style of animation. You know, Steamboat Willie? Anyway, when I first saw this game announced, I was head over heels excited. When it comes to animation like this, along with the music, it screamed, Brooke will love this game, and that I did. Despite my already established lack of skill, it doesn't bother me so much because I know that every time I get hit and or die, it's my fault. I called this game difficult earlier, but honestly I have a hard time doing so because it's memorizing tells. Beppy the Clown is not that difficult, guys! Just shut up and nut up. This game is really great in short bursts, and with the announcer at every attempt, you can't help but continue on and learn the tell of each boss. Of all the games I've played, this is one of the few that actually came out in 2017, and boy I'm glad I was able to make it so. I'm coming for you, Satan. This list is just starting to boil down to my aesthetic. For those of you who've been following my channel, you would know that I've been playing through the first Bioshock because I've not actually played it before. I had seen playthroughs so I knew a bit about what I was doing, but it's vastly different when you actually get the chance to play it. For a 2007 FPS, I say it holds up really well. The shooting isn't awkward, though friendly firing a big daddy can go jump off a cliff. It feels great to be able to experience one of the most classic FPSs for myself. This game is oozing with atmosphere of a city fallen from grace. It has this 40s, 50s vibe that I adore with the music and how everything is stylized in advertisements and architecture. I knew I would enjoy the camera feature, but I didn't know I'd like it this much. Is this why people want another Pokemon Snap? Huh, I finally understand. The little details in this game are also fantastic. From how health pickups work to even just water filling a room. There are so many little touches that make this game better than I thought originally. Also, I'm a pansy. I don't scream a whole lot, but it's very easy to spook me, especially with a rundown creep me out atmosphere like this has. I will press on, however, because this game is pretty great. Made even better because I've been sharing my experiences with all of you via streaming. You guys give me the strength to press forward. Alright, so this game was a lot like other story-heavy games that if I literally tell you anything about one shot, it will ruin the experience for you. Even getting footage for this game is difficult because I don't want to spoil anything in this game. So I'll say this. It's a crime that this game got overshadowed when it came out and I'm so glad I played it. I recommend you do too. It has an intimate vibe. In a you feel close and absorbed and involved kind of way, not a romantic or otherwise that'd be odd. Also, Nico is adorable and I will protect them. They are my precious cat child and no one can take that away from me. Speaking of story heavy games, though I can say a little bit more about this than I can about One Shot. Finding Paradise is a game about two people, Dr. Eva Rosalind and Dr. Neil Watts, who work for the company that fulfilled dying patients' last wishes. They do this by changing the memories of their clients. Now if this sounds familiar at all, it's because it's the next game that directly follows To The Moon from 2011. The music is fantastic and the story, while different in tone from its predecessor, is also engaging in trying to unravel what exactly is going on. I've been waiting for this game for so long and I was not disappointed. Seriously, like, this is some great stuff. Admittedly, I was a little worried that it failed to live up to expectations, but those fears were ended almost immediately. Freebird Games doesn't copy and paste their story. They have different stories they want to weave into an overarching narrative and it works. Finding Paradise is wonderful and... Crap, what's this liquid streaming down my face? I'm not crying, you're crying! I love Persona 5. It's a fantastic game, a fantastic Persona game, and has so much style I can't contain it. It has become one of my favorite games, period. The cast and other confidants are all great and immediately likable in some way, shape, or another. The plot is interesting as it tosses and turns you in what I can say is a legitimately satisfying final boss. I won't spoil it here, but the end of the fight is as fitting as it could be for this game. 
I loved the change for how you obtain personas with the negotiation system rather than the card system and having to play a mini game for a chance to get a persona. It gave the shadows more character. The confidants giving you something in return for ranking up with them is also fantastic and they are all useful. And if I had to pick a few to max besides the party members are Death Star, Tower, and Hierophant. And while the game has kicked my rear end on more than one occasion, it's an Atlas game, it's kind of par for the course. That didn't stop me from finishing this game and looking forward to New Game Plus. I was so glad my first impressions didn't stick once I got a hold of this game myself. Seriously, I didn't like the designs of Morgana and Ryuji and I thought they were just going to be rehashed Teddy and Kanji slash Yosuke from Persona 4. I'm so glad I was wrong. I was completely blown away by everything this game threw at me. Just- I love this game!